Welcome to the Renaissance Spirit. Salve, friends. I am Marcus Tullius Cicero, once a defender of the Roman Republic, its principles, and its people. As consul, senator, and orator, I stood firm against the rising tides of tyranny and corruption that sought to dismantle our Republic. As I was perusing the infinite expanse of knowledge that is afforded to us in the afterlife, wearing my, my bunny slippers and eating some olives and oiled bread with the most enticing hint of garlic and oregano, I came across an interesting article by Stephen Starr on The Guardian's website, link in description. Not my first trip to their site, I must attest, as I appreciate their honest reporting. The article highlights a disturbing rise in tensions in Springfield, Ohio, where neo-Nazi groups like Blood Tribe have been spreading anti-Haitian rhetoric, sparking fear among the local immigrant community. These extremists, including members of Blood Tribe, have attended city meetings to stoke fears, falsely accusing Haitian migrants of crimes such as stealing pets for food. Despite no credible evidence of these claims, they have gained traction online and were even echoed by former President Donald Trump during a recent debate, further fueling xenophobia. Both the mayor of Springfield, Rob Rue, and Ohio Republican Governor DeWine, admitted these were false rumors, ergo lies. In my time, I believed the greatest threat to the state was the erosion of public virtue and the rise of unchecked power forces embodied in the likes of Julius Caesar. For these beliefs, I faced exile, assassination attempts, and ultimately death. I bet you're wondering the tantalizing details as to whether I was still alive when they cut of my hands before nailing them to the Senate doors, to which you may continue to wonder, I never faltered. I never faltered in my duty to the Republic and to the ideals that bind citizens together. I did not expect to write again, much less to address you, citizens of a distant future, in a place called America. But the stench of tyranny reaches across centuries, and the rot I once fought in Rome now festers within your lands. When I see the rise of populism, demagogues, and the ignorance that fuels division in your time, I cannot remain silent. I speak today because I recognize too well the symptoms of a decaying republic, the same ailments that led to Rome's fall. And while I am a figure from ancient history, my words remain timeless, for the struggle between virtue and corruption, between democracy and tyranny, is eternal. The sins against conscience, reason, and humanity, the exploitation of fear, the corrosion of truth, and the dehumanization of others are not new. They are the very sins that led to my beloved Republic's demise. And now, I see them taking root in your Republic, infecting the minds and hearts of its citizens, much as they did in Rome. So, I take up the quill once more, to show you how the lessons of Rome may help you in this battle for the soul of your nation. I am compelled to speak on this illustration of the ills in modern America, represented so starkly by the tragedy in Springfield, Ohio, because I know these dangers well. Your struggles are not unlike those we faced in Rome. Your Republic, like mine, risks falling prey to ignorance, apathy, and tyrannical forces that manipulate the very virtues that once made it great. Ironic that their very movement's motto is Make America Great Again, for they themselves are the ones that have debased America, their people, and the outside world. And in the case of climate change, the entire Earth herself, home to civilizations and people, our entire race. Why aren't you all doing more to prevent climate change for our progeny? But I forget myself, my apologies. Who better to speak on the comparison than I, Cicero, a man who witnessed firsthand the rot of a decaying republic? I stood against Caesar's tyranny and the corruption of the Roman elite, and now I see the same dynamics at play 
in your time from my vantage point, behind the veil, hopefully, a much wiser soul than I was when I walked the streets of my beloved Rome those thousands of years ago. But let us walk together down those streets now as we journey through this tale together, as I reveal how the path to tyranny in Rome can be seen in your own nation's history and how you, like the citizens of Rome, hold the power to either resist or succumb to it. You will find that the price of apathy is high and the defense of public virtue must be constant. If you are to avoid the fate that befell my republic, it is vital that you understand how history repeats itself and how the lessons of Rome can save you from the same ruin. But I also come to you today as an outsider, one who is looking in from afar, but also as an outsider from point of view that I know what it feels to be an outsider amongst equals. I was not born in a fine domus in Rome, but in a village known as Arpinum, Latium, now Arpino, Italy, 118.1 kilometers from Rome's mighty gates. Oh, my apologies again. You Americans don't know kilometers. That's a little over 73 miles. I was also an outsider in that I wasn't born to Rome's senatorial class. I had to climb the ladder to get there. That's all the Haitians are trying to do, make a better life for themselves. It's a shame that so many Americans have given up trying to climb that ladder too, while they still have some semblance of it. I also find it necessary to discuss xenophobia, ethnocentrism, and racism, and how the far right are using those as weapons against our shared humanity, dividing and trying to conquer the hearts and minds of the Your Nation. The events unfolding in Springfield, Ohio, are a striking case study in the dangers of ignorance, xenophobia, apathy, and the seduction of fear-mongering. As the neo-Nazi group, Blood Tribe seeks to scapegoat Haitian immigrants, we must consider the broader societal failures that allowed this hatred to take root. Apathy and ignorance are the silent architects of hatred leading ordinary people to accept the lies peddled by the far right, just as it has always been. This apathy did not emerge in a vacuum. It was nurtured by decades of disengagement from civic life, ignorance of history, and the slow dismantling of education. Haitian immigrants in Springfield have reported increased threats, vandalism, and harassment, with some choosing to stay home out of fear. The immigrants have expressed concerns over the safety of Haitian residents, while local officials have struggled to dispel the falsehoods spreading online. This has also led to extremist groups like Patriot Front organizing marches, amplifying the chaos in the city. The article also explains in more depth and context as to what brought the Haitians to Springfield and their treatment and the resentment they felt from some residents. In the 1980s, President Reagan famously declared that government was the problem, setting the stage for a me generation that retreated from public responsibility and embraced a hollow individualism. The consequences of this were profound, leading many Americans to isolate themselves, turning away from the global community and disengaging from civic duty. Education, particularly civics, became an afterthought a casualty of budget cuts. With the decline in public education, people lost a fundamental understanding of their rights and responsibilities as citizens. They no longer knew what it meant to engage in the body politic or to think critically about the world. As I stated in my speech against Catiline, book one, a nation can survive its fools and even the ambitious, but it cannot survive treason from within and treason has indeed come from within. Neo-Nazis like Blood Tribe have seized on this ignorance, using the Haitian community of Springfield as scapegoats to spread baseless lies. A simple accident one Haitian driver causing a tragic crash became a rallying cry for extremists. 
They claim these immigrants are savages, stealing pets for food, accusations with no basis in reality, but endlessly parroted by the likes of Donald Trump, as he did during his terrible performance in the presidential debate against Kamala Harris. I tip my laurel wreath to her. It takes a strong person to stand up to a tyrant. I ought to know. I was killed by Mark Antony and probably Octavian after all. Trump, this modern-day demagogue, much like Caesar in my time, manipulates the fears of the ignorant to build power. The difference, though, is staggering. Caesar, for all his faults, was at least a man of intellect and ambition. Trump is neither, for he is driven by an insatiable vanity and a reckless disregard for the republic and people he pretends to protect. The far right has perfected a strategy that preys on ignorance. Blood Tribe, like many extremist groups, understands that an uninformed public is easier to manipulate. Their targets often white, undereducated, and frustrated with a world they do not understand are susceptible to conspiracies. They feed off each other's fears, forming alliances of hate, lies, and extremism. They spew their hatred privately behind closed doors, as well as publicly in social media and rallies. Apathy has made them easy prey for charlatans like Trump, who use their anger to further his own political ends. And so, a once proud republic teeters on the edge, not unlike the Rome I fought so hard to save. As I wrote in Delegibus, the more laws, the less justice. One of the tragic ironies of modern America is that while the rule of law still ostensibly stands, justice has become more elusive than ever. In Reagan's America, wealth became the measure of success, and the pursuit of profit outweighed the pursuit of virtue. The wealthiest few grew richer, while the majority were left to struggle. The criminality and moral bankruptcy of these so-called leaders went unchallenged because civic education had withered. Fewer citizens understood how to engage in democracy, to question authority, or to demand justice for all, not just the wealthy. This is how we arrived at Springfield, where hatred festers because ignorance allows it to. And due to machinations in the halls of power, Trump and Republicans in Congress have stacked the court with their ilk, often through holding back nominations of more qualified and objective candidates. In Pro Marcello, I opined that poor is the nation that has no heroes, but poorer still is the nation that forgets its heroes. To the people who have fallen victim to the far right's lies, understand that you have been manipulated by a strange alliance of billionaires, white nationalists and Christian nationalists. You are told that they fight for you, that they will restore America to greatness, but what they truly seek is power for themselves. They prey upon your frustrations, feeding you lies about immigrants and people of color, all while lining their own pockets. Neo-Nazis, billionaires, and extremists don't share your values. They are united by a common greed and desire for control. Their alliances are born not out of shared belief, but out of convenience. They feed off each other's hatred, amplifying the worst impulses in American society. He only employs his passion who can make no use of his reason. I said in De Officius and far-right figures like Trump and the many demagogues who followed him know this well. They do not speak to your reason because reason would expose their lies. Instead, they use your anger and fear build themselves up, leaving you more isolated and disenfranchised. Their criminality is evident. Their lies clear for anyone willing to see. But apathy allows these forces to grow unchecked, just as it did in the final years of the Roman Republic. How do you break free? The answer lies in the very virtues that have been eroded by years of disengagement. It lies in civility, reason, and above all, civic engagement and empathy and compassion. 
education must be restored to its rightful place with a focus on civics that teaches every American their rights, their responsibilities, and their shared humanity. We must reject the lies of race, a concept invented to divide, and remember that we are all part of the same human family. The DNA that binds us is nearly identical, and the divisions of race, religion, and class are tools used by the powerful to keep us from uniting against their tyranny. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't discuss the importance of immigration, an extremely contested topic in modern America. I know the topic is controversial, but as I wrote in Letters to Atticus, I have always been of the opinion that unpopularity earned by doing what is right is not unpopularity at all, but glory. As a son of the Roman Republic, allow me to reflect on the nature of immigration and its importance, drawing comparisons between the Rome I knew and the America of today. In both nations, immigration has been not merely a byproduct of empire, but a source of renewal, of strength, of growth. Let us examine how Rome, a city founded by immigrants, thrived because of the diversity of peoples, ideas, and perspectives that it welcomed at least more often than not. Rome, from its very inception, was a city of migrants and exiles. Romulus, our legendary founder, opened the gates of the newly founded Rome to all manner of men, fugitives, wanderers, and refugees from surrounding cities. This initial influx of diverse peoples was crucial to the city's survival. Much as Rome could not have existed without those who came to it seeking new lives, so too has America been shaped by those who sought its shores with hope in their hearts. As the poet Virgil wrote of our city, Aeneas, driven by fate and exile, came to Italy, thus weaving a tale that mirrored the countless migrations that sustained Rome through the centuries. In my own time, I wrote, Patria est communis omnium parens. The homeland is the common parent of us all. This was not just a statement of civic unity, but of a broader understanding that those who came to Rome, whether by force or by choice, became part of its collective identity. Rome's borders expanded not simply by military conquest, but by incorporating peoples from Spain, Gaul, Greece, and beyond, each adding their own customs, languages, and religions to the Roman fabric. America, in this regard, follows a path strikingly similar to our own. Yet, what truly made Rome great was not merely the absorption of peoples, but the toleration of their differences. In matters of religion, philosophy, and law, Rome was flexible, understanding that unity was found not in uniformity, but in a shared civic spirit. As I once observed, Salus Populi Suprema Lex Esto, the welfare of the people, is the highest law. De Legibus, third three. For Rome, this often meant allowing different traditions to flourish, for even in diversity, there was strength. Of course, this tolerance was not without limits. My own lifetime saw exceptions to this open-mindedness, especially with regard to the Jews and Christians, whose steadfastness to their own singular beliefs seemed to challenge Rome's pluralism. But such episodes were anomalies, not the rule. The broader Roman experience was one of incorporating new ideas and peoples, even those who seemed alien at first. For example, when Greek philosophers arrived, they brought with them ways of thinking that would forever alter Roman culture, much as immigrants to America have brought with them new ideas, technologies, and innovations, as well as a love for their new homeland. They want to be in America, to experience and participate in civics and society. In fact, they are often more education on civics and America's history than many of your native-born. Consider how America has benefited from waves of immigration, how the labor, creativity, and resilience of these newcomers have revitalized its economy, 
enriched its culture, and broadened its worldview. The American Republic must, as Rome once did, remember that its greatness lies in its ability to adapt, to absorb, and to grow from within through those who come seeking a better life. Rome, for all its faults and ultimate decline, teaches us that diversity, if managed wisely, is a source of strength. As I wrote in my Pro Balbo, we are not born for ourselves alone. Our country claims a share of our being and our friends a share. Pro Balbo 22. Let this remind America that in sharing the burdens and blessings of citizenship, immigrants bring not threats, but opportunities. The spirit of civics and virtue demands that we embrace this ensuring that the Republic endures not through exclusion, but through inclusion and the cultivation of a common good. Thus, the lessons of Rome are clear. Immigration is not a problem to be solved, but a foundation upon which Republics are built. From your earliest British, Irish and Scottish immigrants to everyone who came after, they each left an indelible mark on America, making it stronger and in so doing, helped America to become that shining city on a hill that Reagan so prized in his speeches. Let me speak now to those who find themselves ensnared by the far right's rhetoric, by neo-Nazis like Blood Tribe, or by the shallow promises of a demagogue like Trump. Do you believe you have been wronged? That your country is slipping away from you? You are not alone in that belief. But I urge you to question, who is truly to blame for your misfortune? The Haitian immigrants in Springfield, who have come here to seek a better life, just as many of your own ancestors did. Or those who whisper in your ear, filling your heart with suspicion and hatred, all while profiting off your fear. The far-right leadership, with its cocktail of billionaires, Christian nationalists, and white supremacists, knows precisely what they are doing. They do not truly care for you, the common citizen. You are a pawn in their game, just as many Romans were manipulated by demagogues who sought only their own gain. These far-right leaders, whether they march with Nazi flags or rally crowds at the altar of Make America Great Again, are united not by a genuine vision for America, but by a desire to increase their power, to expand their wealth, and to tighten their grip over your very lives. And yet, these extremists would have you believe that their hatred serves the people. They would have you think that the Haitian immigrants in your midst are a threat to your welfare. But let me be clear, the real danger comes from within. It comes from those who seek to exploit your discontent, who fan the flames of racism and xenophobia, and who rely on your ignorance to carry out their agenda. Look at Donald Trump, a man of immense wealth who pretends to be one of you. He tells you that immigrants, Muslims, people of color, these are the reasons your wages are low your communities are struggling, but does he tell you that his policies and those of the billionaire class he represents have siphoned wealth from the middle class, left your education systems in tatters, and stripped you of the very civic virtues that once made your republic strong? As I wrote in Pro Archia Poeta, there are more men ennobled by study than by nature, and let me assure you, the far right has studied the texts of tyranny and tyrants. What a strange group indeed this far-right coalition is. Neo-Nazis marching with Christian nationalists, billionaires shaking hands with white supremacists. How can these alliances exist, you might ask? The answer is simple. They are not built on common values, but on mutual convenience. Each group sees in the other an opportunity to expand their power, and so they turn a blind eye to their differences. The Christian nationalists preach about family values and the sanctity of life, 
while marching shoulder to shoulder with neo-Nazis whose very ideology is built on violence and hatred. The billionaires, meanwhile, are all too happy to stoke the fires of white grievance, knowing that a divided and fearful populace will not challenge their stranglehold on wealth and power. And what do they offer you in return? A false sense of superiority, a hollow promise that if you only embrace their hatred, you too can have a piece of the American dream. Any man can make mistakes, but only an idiot persists in his error, I wrote in Philippics, but the lesson doesn't end there. You are not beyond redemption. If you have been swept up by this wave of hatred, if you have found yourself buying into the lies of the far right, I implore you to stop and reflect. To ask yourself, what have these people truly done for me? Have they made my life better? Have they lifted my community? Or have they simply left me angrier, more isolated, and further disconnected from my fellow citizens? To break free from their lies, you must return to the values that once made this republic strong. Empathy, civility, reason. These are not outdated ideals. They are the foundation upon which a functioning society rests. When we strip away the lies of race and class, we are left with one undeniable truth. We are all part of the same human family. Our DNA is 99.9% .9 identical. The divisions we cling to are fabrications designed by the powerful to keep us weak. The path forward is clear. We must reinvigorate civic engagement, rekindle the pursuit of knowledge, and teach every citizen their rights and responsibilities. Education, which has been so woefully neglected since the Reagan years, must be restored. Civics must be prioritized once again, so that no American is left ignorant of how their government works, how their democracy can be protected, and how they can contribute to the common good. Apathy is the enemy of democracy. The far right thrives on disengagement, on a populace that is too ignorant or too indifferent to resist their lies. But we can change that. We must reject the culture of division and hatred that has taken hold of our country and instead embrace a Renaissance spirit, a spirit of learning, compassion, and unity. As I said before, Trump is no Caesar. Caesar, at least, had the intellect and ambition to reshape the Roman world. Trump, he is but a shallow, reckless man who would burn your republic to the ground if it meant another day in power. It is up to you, the citizens of this great republic, to stop him. When Ronald Reagan entered office, he brought with him a vision of America that glorified individualism and self-reliance, a stark contrast to the civic responsibility that had once been a hallmark of the Republic. In the pursuit of deregulation and lower taxes, Reagan's policies initiated a transformation that would lead to a growing sense of isolation among citizens. No longer were Americans encouraged to see themselves as part of a collective, working together for the common good. Instead, they were told to look out for themselves, to seek their own gain, and to view government as an obstacle to their personal success. This shift gave birth to what some would later call the Me Generation, a culture of self-interest that eroded the bonds of civic engagement. Schools, starved of funding, cut back on essential program civics being among the first casualties. The very idea of being an informed, engaged citizen fell out of favor. In its place, a new identity emerged, the consumer citizen, whose value was measured not by their participation in democracy, but by their ability to buy, consume, and accumulate wealth. It is no surprise, then, that decades later, a figure like Donald Trump could rise to power. He is the ultimate product of Reagan's America, 
a businessman with no regard for civic duty, who used the machinery of democracy to advance his own interests. Trump, like Reagan before him, sold Americans on a lie that the solution to their problems was not engagement, not a return to civic virtue, but a further retreat into tribalism, greed, and self-interest. As I wrote in Pro Malone, for liberty is rendered even more precious by the recollection of servitude. And what has this retreat into self-interest brought? The neo-Nazi marches in Springfield, Ohio, are but one symptom of a larger disease. The corrosion of civic life, the abandonment of reason and empathy, and the rise of hatred and fear. These white supremacists prey on the disillusioned, offering them a false sense of community and purpose, just as Trump offered disillusioned Americans the false promise of a return to greatness. But what is the price of this greatness? Is it not, in fact, the very opposite of liberty? When we allow ourselves to be manipulated by fear, when we turn our backs on our fellow citizens, whether they be Haitian immigrants or our neighbors across the street, we are not preserving democracy. We are surrendering it to the tyrants and the demagogues, just as my beloved Roman Republic once surrendered to Caesar. Let me now address the peculiar alliance that has formed around Trump and the far-right extremists who support him. How is it that Christian nationalists who claim to follow the teachings of Christ can align themselves with neo-Nazis whose ideology is rooted in hatred and violence? How can billionaires who thrive on capitalism and free markets join forces with those who seek to upend the very system that made them wealthy? The answer is simple. They are united by a common desire for power. The Christian nationalists see in Trump a means of imposing their narrow vision of morality on the nation. The neo-Nazis see in him a champion for white supremacy. And the billionaires, they see in Trump a useful tool to further deregulate the economy and consolidate their wealth. Each of these groups feeds off the other, and together they form a dangerous cabal that threatens the very foundations of democracy. They use lies, fear, and hatred to manipulate the masses, just as Julius Caesar once used bread and circuses to keep the Roman mob distracted. But make no mistake, this alliance is not built on shared values. It is built on a shared contempt for democracy and a shared desire to maintain their stranglehold on power. In De Divinazione, I wrote, the wise are instructed by reason, average minds by experience, the stupid by necessity, and the brute by instinct. How, then, can we break free from this dangerous cycle? How can we protect our democracy from the likes of Trump and the far-right extremists who support him? The answer lies in a return to reason, civics, and compassion. We must revive the civic virtues that once made this republic great virtues that have been systematically eroded by decades of greed, ignorance, and disengagement. We must educate ourselves and our fellow citizens about the workings of government, the rights and responsibilities of citizenship, and the importance of empathy and compassion in a democratic society. We must also reject the lie of race. Race, as we understand it today, did not exist in my time. The divisions between Romans and Gauls, Greeks and Egyptians were not based on skin color or biological difference. They were cultural, political, and more often than not, convenient tools for the powerful to maintain control, just as they are today. To allow ourselves to be divided along racial lines is to fall into the trap set by the wealthy and powerful, who use our divisions to keep us weak and subservient. In De Republica, I wrote, Justice, which is the bond of society, can exist only where men associate in equality. We are all part of the same human family. Our DNA is 99.9% .9 identical, regardless of the color of our skin, the language we speak, 
or the country we call home. To divide ourselves along racial lines is to deny our common humanity and to play into the hands of those who seek to exploit us for their own gain. It is time, my friends, to cast off the yoke of ignorance and hatred. It is time to embrace the Renaissance spirit, the spirit of knowledge, reason, and compassion that once lifted humanity out of the dark ages and into the light of enlightenment. It is time to become citizens once again, fully engaged in the workings of our democracy and fully committed to the pursuit of justice, liberty, and equality for all. As I wrote in Diophyses, we were born to unite with our fellow men and to join in community with the human race. Do you agree? To be a citizen is not merely to live within the boundaries of a nation, it is to engage with it fully. Citizenship is an honor, a duty, and a responsibility. It requires vigilance, empathy, and an unwavering commitment to the common good. We must look beyond our own narrow interests and understand that the strength of the nation lies in its people, all of its people. To retreat into apathy is to abdicate this responsibility, to let hatred flourish unchecked. As citizens, we must be advocates for justice, ambassadors of peace, and stewards of the world we will leave to future generations. And to those who still follow Trump and his ilk, I say this, you are not fighting for America's greatness. You are fighting for its destruction. The modern-day Caesar you follow is not a leader of vision, but a man of vanity and recklessness who would sooner see the Republic burn than sacrifice his own comfort. Trump is no Caesar indeed. He is worse, for Caesar at least had the mind of a statesman. Trump is but a tyrant in a gilded suit. As I said in Diophytes, Freedom is a possession of inestimable value, for in the end, we are all responsible for the fate of the Republic and our own freedom. The rot that began with Reagan's culture wars, which escalated under Trump's demagoguery, can only be undone by a renewed commitment to civic virtue. We must revive the Renaissance spirit, a spirit of learning, reason, and compassion and engage fully with the world around us. Only then can we hope to overcome the forces of ignorance, hatred, and division that threaten to tear us apart. History has not died, but our understanding of it has faltered. It is time to reawaken that understanding, and in doing so, save the Republic from itself. To be a citizen is to embrace both rights and duties. In ancient Rome, citizenship was not a passive condition, but an active role. It required participation, engagement, and above all, a sense of responsibility for the well-being of the Republic. So too must it be in America, yet for too long, the concept of citizenship has been eroded first by the self-interested policies of Ronald Reagan, and then by the tribalist authoritarian impulses of Donald Trump. Under Reagan, the civic virtues that once bound Americans together began to unravel. His focus on individualism, deregulation, and cutting taxes for the rich may have brought prosperity to some, but it also left many others behind, isolated in a world increasingly dominated by corporate interests. Schools, especially public ones, were underfunded, and civics education, the very tool necessary to create engaged citizens, was gutted without a proper understanding of government, of rights and responsibilities. It became all too easy for Americans to retreat into apathy, to believe the convenient lies spun by opportunistic politicians. Freedom is participation in power, as I stated in De Republica. The disengaged, uninformed citizenry that Reagan's policies helped create has only grown in number since his time. 
And now, they have found a champion in Trump who offers not a return to democratic participation, but a hollow vision of greatness built on exclusion, hatred, and division. Trump's appeal lies not in any real solutions to the problems facing America, but in his ability to tap into the fear and ignorance that decades of civic disengagement have fostered. What does it mean, then, to be a citizen in such a time? It means, first and foremost, rejecting the cynicism and apathy that the far right thrives on. It means educating oneself about the workings of government, about the history of the Republic, and about the rights and duties that come with citizenship. It means standing up to the forces of hatred and division, whether they come in the form of neo-Nazi marches in Springfield, Ohio, or the President of the United States himself. He alone has looked on the Republic, who has looked on it in thought, who has meditated on its structure, and who has understood its laws. I once wrote in De Republica, I certainly wasn't talking about Trump when I wrote that. And let's be clear, Trump is an authoritarian and tyrant, but of the man himself, Trump is no Caesar. I, Cicero, had no love for Caesar's tyranny, but I must admit that he was a man of intellect, of ambition, and in some ways, of vision. Caesar sought to reshape the Roman world, and while I opposed his actions, I could at least understand his motives. Trump, on the other hand, is a man driven by vanity, by a reckless desire for personal gain, and by a dangerous indifference to the very principles upon which your republic was founded. Trump's reign is not one of reform or revolution, but of chaos and destruction. He has no grand vision for America, no understanding of the responsibilities that come with leadership. He is a tyrant of the worst kind, one who seeks power not to serve the people, but to serve himself. And yet, millions of Americans have fallen under his spell, seduced by his promises of a return to a mythical past where white supremacy reigned unchecked and the rest of the world was kept at bay. What bears true in the past holds true in the present. As I wrote in On the Republic, the greatest of republics, the greatest democracy, has fallen into the hands of a demagogue. How can this be? How can so many Americans born into a democracy embrace the lies of a man who would gladly tear it all down? The answer, once again, lies in apathy and ignorance. For too long, the citizens of this republic have been disengaged from the political process, content to let others make decisions for them. And now, they find themselves adrift, susceptible to the false promises of a man like Trump, who offers them not empowerment, but submission to his will. For what is more noble than to join in the study of letters, to reflect on the lives of great men, and to dedicate oneself to the pursuit of wisdom and virtue. I once wrote in the Tusculan Disputations, you honor me with your continued viewing. Thank you. Now on to race, my esteemed viewer and traveler with me, on the road to ages past and present. Race, as I have said before, is a lie. In my time, we did not divide ourselves based on the color of our skin. The divisions we observed were cultural and political, not the pseudo-scientific hogwash of racism. And yet, throughout history, race has been used as a tool by the powerful to divide and conquer, to keep the masses weak and fearful. Trump and his far-right allies are no different. They use the lie of race to pit Americans against one another, to distract you from the true enemy the corrupt, greedy elites who seek to control you. It is time to reject their lies. It is time to embrace the truth that we are all equal, that we all deserve dignity and respect, and that we all have a role to play in preserving this republic. We stand at a crossroads, just as Rome did in the final days of its republic. In my time, the erosion of civic engagement 
and the rise of tyranny led to the fall of our democracy. It is a bitter lesson, one that I hope you in modern America can still avoid. But to do so, you must act swiftly and decisively, for the forces of ignorance, hatred, and authoritarianism are gaining ground. I have spoken of the dangers posed by Reagan's policies of individualism, of the false promises of Trump, and of the ignorance that allows neo-Nazis to march in the streets of Springfield, Ohio. These are not isolated problems. They are symptoms of a deeper disease, the breakdown of civic virtue and the abandonment of reason and compassion. As I wrote in Delegibus, the welfare of the people is the ultimate law. What then does it mean to restore civic virtue to them? And this is the important bit. It means returning to the idea that being a citizen is not a passive condition, but an active duty. It means understanding that democracy requires more than just voting every few years. It requires constant vigilance, participation, and engagement. It means recognizing that the strength of a republic lies not in its leaders, but in its citizens. And the citizens hold the power if they are dedicated and vigilant enough to keep it. You must educate yourselves and your children in the principles of government and the values of democracy. You must demand that civics education be restored to its rightful place in your schools, for without it, future generations will be just as vulnerable to the lies of demagogues as the present generation has been. With the ever greater threats to climate change, shared human values, and climate change, our progeny and posterity will need to be well-versed on the virtues of civic duty which I've covered in my video exposing the dangers of Project 2025. Watch that and my other videos next. But education alone is not enough. You must also practice empathy and compassion in your daily lives. You must reject the fear and hatred that the far right uses to divide you and instead embrace the idea that all people regardless of their race, religion, or nationality, deserve dignity and respect. I understand your anger, whether be on the right or the left. You each have grievances against the other, or so you've been told. But violence is never the answer. Ask Julius Caesar, who was taken by Brutus's hand, or Brutus who was taken, as was I, by Mark Antony's hand, or Mark Antony and Cleopatra, by Octavian's hand. No one wins when the goal and means is violence. As I said in De Officiis, an unjust peace is better than a just war. The alliance between the far-right extremists, the Christian nationalists, and the wealthy elites who support Trump is built on a foundation of greed and division. They seek to pit you against one another, to make you believe that your fellow citizens are your enemies while they consolidate their power and wealth. You must reject this false dichotomy. The true enemy is not your neighbor, whether they be Haitian or American, black or white, Christian or Muslim. The true enemy is the greed and corruption that seeks to turn you against each other, to distract you from the real issues facing your nation, economic inequality, climate change, and the erosion of democracy. The far right thrives on chaos. They use fear and misinformation to make you believe that the only way to restore order is through authoritarianism. But this is a lie. The solution to the problems facing your society is not more division, more hatred, more authoritarianism. It is more democracy, more engagement, more compassion. There comes a time in every society when its citizens must choose between servitude and freedom, between apathy and action. America in this moment stands on the precipice of such a choice. Those who seek to manipulate you, 
be they far-right extremists, Christian nationalists, or the political opportunists of the MAGA movement, understand the power of fear. They thrive on your division, feeding off your anxieties, while offering simplistic, yet dangerously flawed, solutions. Let this be your call to action. Your republic is fragile, as all democracies are, and it will only survive if its citizens are engaged, informed, and compassionate. The forces of ignorance, hatred, and authoritarianism are strong, but they can be defeated if you are willing to rise to the challenge. Reclaim your role as citizens of a great republic. Embrace the Renaissance spirit and let it guide you toward a future of justice, equality, and compassion. The fate of your democracy and of the world depends on it. Live as if you were to die tomorrow. Learn as if you were to live forever. I wrote in my Tusculan Disputations, and it is this lesson I want you to learn. Consider the neo-Nazis in Springfield, Ohio. They march under the banner of hate, exploiting the economic and social insecurities of white Americans to further their vile agenda. And who suffers in the wake of their campaigns? The most vulnerable, immigrants like the Haitian community who seek only a better life. By pitting neighbor against neighbor, these hate groups aim to dismantle the very fabric of your society. For as I think, the man who deserts his fellow man, who by choice abstains from aiding and benefiting his kind, is to be regarded as an outlaw, a savage, and an enemy of the human race. I wrote in Diofichis, the true danger here lies not in the rhetoric of the extremists themselves, but in the complacency and ignorance of the broader population. The neo-Nazis are not operating in a vacuum. They are exploiting a fertile ground that has been cultivated for decades by politicians and leaders who stoked division and dismantled civic understanding. This was the legacy of the 1980s and era in which Ronald Reagan, with his policies of isolationism and trickle-down economics, promoted a me generation that prioritized self-interest over community. Through this philosophy, Americans were encouraged to withdraw from global engagement, to see the world outside their borders as irrelevant, and to focus instead on personal gain. As education funding was slashed, particularly in civics, generations of Americans grew up without a clear understanding of their own government, of their rights and duties as citizens, and of the importance of empathy toward those different from themselves. Liberty consists in the power of doing that which is permitted by the law. I wrote in Delegibus, which only goes to show that Donald J. Trump is no avid reader of my works. Donald Trump, who seized upon this fertile soil of apathy and ignorance. Unlike Caesar, who sought to reshape the Roman world with ambition and intellect, Trump is a man of impulse, driven by his insatiable need for personal gain and attention. He is no philosopher king, but a merchant of chaos, willing to tear apart the very foundations of your republic if it suits his ends. Trump's manipulation of facts and reality taps into the ignorance that has been festering for decades. He promotes a world of alternative facts where truth is subjective and fear becomes the primary currency. His supporters, many of whom have suffered from economic hardship and social dislocation, have been led to believe that their problems are caused not by systemic inequality or corruption, but by immigrants, by minorities, and by those who dare to challenge their worldview. And yet despite his tyrannical tendencies, Trump is not Caesar. For Caesar, whatever his faults, had a strategic mind and a vision for Rome's future, albeit one I opposed. Trump, by contrast, offers nothing but division and destruction. In a republic, this rule ought to be observed, that the majority should not have the predominant power. I once wrote in De Repubblica, 
What is even more dangerous is the cabal of billionaire elites and far-right Christian nationalists who prop up Trump's reign. Their agenda is clear, to consolidate power and wealth at the expense of the many, to undermine democracy, and to impose their narrow vision of what America should be. These groups feed off each other's extremism, each faction supporting the other in a toxic dance of authoritarianism and greed. They know that an informed, engaged populace would threaten their grip on power, so they do everything in their power to keep the people divided, fearful, and ignorant. The way out of this darkness lies in a return to reason, empathy, and civic virtue. Americans must reject the poisonous rhetoric of division and hatred that has been thrust upon them by those seeking to manipulate their fears. They must educate themselves, not only in the principles of democracy and governance, but in the values of empathy and compassion. It is a profound truth that we are all connected. Your DNA is 99.9% .9 the same as that of your neighbor, whether they are Haitian, Mexican, or white American. The concept of race is a lie, a tool used by the powerful throughout history to divide and conquer. In ancient Rome, we did not classify people based on the color of their skin. We judge people by their actions, their character, and their contributions to the Republic. He who acts unjustly is the worse of the two. For he who does injury does more harm than he who suffers it, I wrote in Diophytes. The modern-day race narrative has been used to justify slavery, segregation, and now far-right extremism. But it is a falsehood, and it is time to cast it aside. We are all part of one human family, and it is only through recognizing our shared humanity that we can build a better world. In Diophyses, I wrote that the greatest of all virtues is justice. Do you agree? Vive Renaissance Spiritus. The journey continues in our conclusion, my friend. You won't want to miss it. In the heart of every true republic lies a sacred bond between its citizens, a bond that goes beyond mere rights and privileges. It is a connection that demands active participation, a deep understanding of one's role in the collective good, and a dedication to preserving the principles of liberty and justice for all. Yet today, in America, many have forgotten the power that comes from citizenship and the moral duties it entails. Through the lens of Springfield, Ohio, and the neo-Nazi infiltration we have witnessed, we can see just how fragile these bonds have become. Hatred and ignorance have crept into the public square, largely unchecked by the civic spirit that once might have defended against them. This is the cost of the long erosion of civic education and virtue. The same decline that began during the Reagan years and continued into the present. During the 1980s, under the guise of individualism and economic freedom, Ronald Reagan set in motion policies that discouraged collective responsibility and engagement in public life. His rhetoric of self-sufficiency and deregulation appealed to an American public eager to break free from the constraints of government. But this freedom came at a price. The shift toward prioritizing personal wealth over public good created a generation increasingly isolated from civic responsibility. Public education, especially civics, was devalued. What once was a shared curriculum meant to prepare young citizens to understand and engage with their democracy became a shadow of its former self. Without knowledge of their own system of government or the historical struggles for justice, citizens became passive. They were no longer the informed electorate envisioned by the founders, but instead became prey to the manipulations of those in power. The whole glory of virtue is inactivity. I wrote in Diophytes, and while much of America has been inactive, 
The same cannot be said of the dangerous far right. This is the environment in which far right movements like the neo Nazis of Springfield have thrived. They exploit the isolation and ignorance that pervades modern America. Their hateful messages are aimed at communities weakened by decades of civic neglect, offering easy answers and scapegoats for complex problems. Reagan's policies of isolationism and the defunding of public services created fertile ground for these movements by reducing the capacity for community engagement and shared understanding. Any man can make mistakes, but only an idiot persists in his error, I once wrote in Philippics. Donald Trump is a man who doesn't learn from his mistakes because accepting fault only proves the inadequacies he tries to hide from himself and the rest of the world, although we see too well the truth. Donald Trump took this legacy of civic disengagement and isolation to new extremes. His rise to power, built on fear-mongering, misinformation, and divisiveness, was made possible by the widespread ignorance of civic processes and the lack of empathy among the populace. Trump weaponized the fears of those who felt left behind by the economic changes of the 21st century. His supporters, many of whom were already disillusioned and isolated, found solace in his bombastic rhetoric. But make no mistake, Trump's promises of national greatness were hollow. His appeals to white supremacy, nationalism, and authoritarianism were not the marks of a strong leader, but of a weak and insecure man. His failure to understand or respect democratic norms, culminating in the January 6th insurrection, was the most egregious assault on American democracy since the Civil War. The greater the empire, the greater the dangers. I once wrote in De Repubblica, like Caesar, Trump sought to centralize power and undermine democratic institutions. But where Caesar at least had a vision of Rome's future, Trump's vision extended no further than his own ego. He stoked division, pitting Americans against each other based on race, religion, and political ideology, with no regard for the long-term consequences. And it was in this atmosphere of division that movements like the neo-Nazis found their foothold, emboldened by the knowledge that their hatred was no longer marginalized, but legitimized by the highest office in the land. The function of wisdom is to discriminate between good and evil, I once wrote in Diophysis, and this may well be the issue with modern America. So many of you have not been taught or abandoned civic virtue and have accepted vice for virtue. To any of my alt-right viewers, I ask this. Do the words out of your mouth, good or evil? The time has come to reclaim the virtues of citizenship. This requires more than just political engagement. It demands a deep understanding of the responsibilities that come with living in a republic. Americans must reject the cynicism and hatred that have divided them, and instead embrace the ideals of empathy, equality, and justice. This is the essence of the Renaissance spirit. To live as a true citizen is to commit to the ongoing pursuit of knowledge, to the defense of liberty, and to the betterment of society for all. It is to reject the idea that some lives are worth more than others, or that anyone's worth can be determined by the color of their skin or the nation of their birth. For there is nothing that is more proper for a human being as the use of reason, I wrote in De Legibus, and to overcome the ignorance that has allowed movements like neo-Nazism to rise, Americans must once again become students of their own democracy. They must invest in education, not just for themselves, but for future generations. They must learn the lessons of history so that they can recognize the warning signs of tyranny and reject it before it takes hold. Justice is the set and constant purpose which gives every man his due. In the end, the fate of American democracy rests in the hands of its citizens.
No leader, no matter how tyrannical, can destroy a republic if its citizens are vigilant, informed, and united. But if citizens allow themselves to be divided and manipulated, if they abdicate their responsibility to engage in public life, then tyranny will prevail. The Renaissance spirit offers a path forward, one based on knowledge, compassion, and a shared commitment to the common good. It is a call to action, a reminder that the power to shape the future lies in the hands of the people. By embracing this spirit, by educating themselves and engaging with their communities, Americans can rebuild the bonds of civic virtue that have been eroded over the past decades. It is time to reject the false promises of authoritarianism and to embrace the values that have sustained great civilizations throughout history, civic duty, education, empathy, and a shared commitment to the common good. This spirit of renewal can guide you not only in your personal lives, but also in your political engagement. It can inspire you to become not just passive citizens, but active participants in the shaping of your democracy. It can lead you to reject the hatred and division that threatens to tear your society apart, and instead to build bridges of understanding and compassion. In embracing the Renaissance spirit, you become part of a long tradition of thinkers, philosophers, and citizens who have fought for justice, equality, and the betterment of humanity. You stand on the shoulders of giants, from the great minds of ancient Rome to the humanists of the Renaissance, and it is now your duty to carry their legacy forward. If there is hope for America, it lies in the renewal of civic engagement, empathy, and compassion. The Renaissance spirit offers a way forward, a path to a just, equitable, and humane society. But this path requires action. It requires that you, the citizens of this republic, take up the mantle of civic virtue and actively participate in your democracy. You must educate yourselves, engage in your communities, and work together to solve the challenges facing your nation. The forces of greed, hatred, and division will always be with us, but they can be defeated if you are willing to rise to the challenge. Reclaim your democracy, embrace your shared humanity, and let the Renaissance spirit guide you toward a future of justice, equality, and compassion. The journey is long, but it is not hopeless. With reason, empathy, and unity, there is still time to restore the Republic and build a future of justice, equality, and democracy. Thank you for watching. Our channel, known as the Renaissance Spirit, is dedicated to the pursuits of a just, equitable, and humanitarian world, and how and why we all need to be the solution to the issues facing us today. Video topics encompass areas including news, analysis, history, politics, religion, personal development, society, culture, social and environmental justice, and other topics of liberal arts and sciences, including ancient Rome and the Roman Empire, which is a great comparison and contrast of the modern world. Topics perfect for the true, modern, and egalitarian polymath, a person with an open mind and the thirst for truth in its many forms and disciplines, a journey through knowledge, reason, and time. The Renaissance ushered in a golden age and the pursuit of knowledge. Knowledge both lost to time and yet to be discovered. It gave birth to the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason and the Age of Humanism. Embracing truth, knowledge, and an understanding and compassion for humanity and our shared history opens up the world to each of us, individually and collectively, enhancing our stewardship of the Earth and our relationships with one another. Living the Renaissance spirit means engaging with history not as a distant past, but as a living dialogue, constantly informing and enriching our present. And the Renaissance spirit 
is a reminder of our dialogue with the future, our progeny and posterity, our legacy. Will we grant them a future free from fear of climate change and tales of the end of democracy? Will they admonish us for our sins and omissions, or will they remember us fondly as saviors of humanity and the natural world? Please take the quiz next to see if you're a Renaissance spirit. The Renaissance spirit, more than just a philosophy or style, but a style for living, learning, growing, and thinking. Please subscribe, turn on notifications, and share. If you're looking to explore and experience life in the steps of the true masters of the Renaissance and free thinkers throughout our past, present, and future. So, dear traveler through time, let us continue this journey together, finding inspiration in the stories of those who came before us and those who come next, and forging a future guided by equality, wisdom, and compassion. Vive Renaissance Spiritus. History has not died, only our understanding of it. Historia non est mortua, said Intellectus Noster. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, you'll also enjoy my other collected video works on our channel. Please peruse those next, my dear viewer. And remember, you have the power to make a better America. I will be watching from my timeless view on the other side of the veil. And don't forget to vote in the November election. I'll be back if you need me. Until then, my friend, peace.